Are you also tired of one-size-fits-all weight loss plans? Meet Noom, the personalized solution that meets you where you are. Noom is able to understand your unique needs, from dietary restrictions to medical concerns. Unlike restrictive programs, Noom embraces your lifestyle and choices. Discover a sustainable approach to weight loss, tailored just for you. Honestly, Noom felt like it was made for me. It's not just about what I eat. It's about understanding why. With Noom, I've learned so much about myself and built healthier habits that stick. It's all about progress, not perfection. Say goodbye to restrictive diets and experience the Noom app for yourself with personalized lessons and expert coaching. Noom's psychology and biology-based approach has helped over 5.2 million people achieve their goals. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M dot com. And check out Noom's first ever cookbook, The Noom Kitchen, for 100 healthy and delicious recipes to promote better living. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. It's time for the July birthday shout outs. You know, I believe in celebrating for the whole month. So hopefully you are all having a great month, not just birthday. I want to say happy birthday to Daniel, Lena, Christina, Sindra, Shay, Emily, Ray, Layla, Janet, Ashley, Alistair, Kelly, Sarah, and Nassim. Happy birthday, and thank you for all of your support over on Patreon. Happy birthday to you. Unlike the majority of male serial killers, female serial killers don't usually kill from a compulsion to kill, but rather for pragmatic reasons. But that doesn't make the trail of destruction any less devastating. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome back if you've been here before. This episode was suggested by Jess, and she also contributed to the research, so a big thank you to her. You know I like a good local story, one where I understand the area and the landscape, and I don't have to rely quite so much on Google Maps. And this is a Kansas City metro area classic true crime case. All areas have their stories that just sort of stick around, and this is definitely one for the Kansas City area. So much so that everyone's favorite Kansas City-based podcaster, Aaron from the Generation Y, was on the Crime to Remember episode about this case. Definitely go watch it if you have a chance because you are not going to see Aaron that dressed up literally any other time. I also saw on Twitter that my friends over at Forgotten News Podcast recently covered this case back in the day when there weren't quite so many true crime podcasts out there. I would actually scrap an episode idea if someone else covered it recently. I don't want to give everybody reruns, but now there are just far too many shows that I would barely have any episodes if I did that. But I did want to shout out Forgotten News so you can go check them out. I'll leave their name in the description just to remind everyone. Okay, so let's get into it. Enough housekeeping. We are going to start with a crumbling marriage in 1960. It's not as though Sharon and James Kinney's marriage had the most rock-solid foundation to begin with. They met in 1956 at a church event when Sharon was just 16 years old and James was 22. James was a college student at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, but he was home in Independence, Missouri for the summer when he met Sharon. Sharon had grown up as Sharon Hall in Independence, except for a short time when her family lived in Washington State when her father's job had taken them there. The city of Independence, where they both grew up, really exploded in the 1950s and 60s. The population in 1940 was 16,000. 20 years later, it was 62,000. And by 1970, it was over 110,000 people. So Sharon grew up as the city was really being developed from farms into a city, but she still saw Independence as a stifling small town 
and was ready to move on to something else even at the age of 16. Friends said she dreamed of California or New York, and she was always reading magazines about glamorous celebrities and parties and movie premieres, all of that. And here is James Kinney, an engineering student who managed to leave independence. Sure, he made it as far as Provo, Utah, no offense to people in the Valley. However, it was closer to California than Missouri was, so sounded good enough to her. That was definitely part of the appeal. They had a whirlwind romance that summer and promised to write when James went back to Utah for the fall semester. And James wasn't back at school long before Sharon wrote to him and told him she was pregnant at not quite 17 years old. In case him going to BYU wasn't clue enough, James was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known informally as the Mormons, and sex before marriage was a sin. The usual answer to pregnancy out of wedlock in the 1950s in and out of the LDS Church was marriage. So James went back to independence and married Sharon in a hasty ceremony. On the marriage license, it was marked that Sharon was a widow, which was untrue. It seems like a possible clerical error, but there were people who said Sharon told them she was briefly married while she was in Washington and her husband had died in a car accident. But seeing as she wasn't quite 17 when she married James, it seems really unlikely that was true. After the wedding, the two moved back to Provo for James to finish school, and shortly after that, Sharon told James she had a miscarriage. But Sharon was soon pregnant again, or for real this time, if you don't believe the first story, and they had a daughter together in 1957. Being that the Kinney daughter was a minor at the time everything happened, and this story really involves her greatly, we are not going to use her real name. We are just going to call her Elizabeth. Juggling family in school wasn't working out, so James Kinney decided to drop out and move the family back to Independence. They moved into a small home near his parents, who were devout Latter-day Saints and not a huge fan of their daughter-in-law, even though she had converted to their religion after the marriage. But grandchildren were the reward for their tolerance of Sharon, so they were happy enough. Soon, the couple had a little boy as well in May of 1959. Not long after their son was born, James and Sharon started seriously discussing divorce. They were arguing all the time, and Sharon was cheating on James with an old high school friend. In fact, she had rekindled her relationship with him not long after they returned from Utah, meaning she spent at least half, if not more, of the marriage seeing someone else. Money was also tight, and Sharon wanted to move on with someone who could provide her with a more comfortable lifestyle and possibly get her out of independence for good. Sharon told James she would be happy to grant him a divorce, except she wanted $1,000 up front, custody of their two children, and the house. $1,000 in 1960 would be more like $9,000 in today's money, so a decent amount to keep Sharon and the kids afloat until she could find a suitable job or find a man, whichever came first. James went to his parents to tell them about the impending divorce and also to ask for their advice. They gave the advice you would expect a very religious couple in 1960 to give. Don't do it. Fix the marriage. Don't leave it. James intended to take this advice, and he did not pursue the divorce. And Sharon didn't initiate it on her own either. But they didn't necessarily work on the marriage, they just didn't divorce. On March 19, 1960, when James and Sharon's daughter Elizabeth was two and a half and their son was 10 months old, Sharon went into the bathroom to get ready for a church dinner. 
James was asleep. He had laid down for a nap. According to Sharon, while she was in the bathroom, she heard Elizabeth go into the bedroom and say, Daddy, how does this thing work? And then she heard a bang. Sharon ran into the bedroom to see James in the bed, bleeding from his head, and Elizabeth standing next to him. Elizabeth had toy guns, like cap guns and those old cowboy-style pistols, and it looked to Sharon like Elizabeth thought she found a toy, only it was James's loaded 22 caliber pistol. James was shot in the back of the head, so obviously he hadn't done it to himself, and Elizabeth was the only one in the room, according to Sharon. Sharon called for an ambulance, but 25-year-old James Kinney was pronounced dead at the scene. The 22 pistol was found on the pillow next to him with the barrel pointed at his head. It appeared that the gun was at that angle when it was fired. The police tried to interview Sharon at the scene, but it was surface level at best because she was so upset that she could not answer that many questions. They also tried to talk to Elizabeth, but at two and a half, she wasn't capable of answering their questions clearly. She could talk and she could answer basics, but not anything about what really happened. The officers at the scene then decided, controversially it would turn out, to not do a gunshot residue test on either Elizabeth or Sharon, because they didn't want to subject them to it. Today, this test is easy. It's not uncomfortable at all. They just swab the hands, and it's not really more invasive than wiping your hands on a cloth. But in 1960, the way gunshot residue tests were done was with paraffin. They poured the warm wax over the suspect's hand, making a cast. The warmth would open up the pores, and then the wax would adhere enough to pull up any contaminants, like the nitrates from gunpowder. After the paraffin hardened, they would spray it with a chemical that would turn blue if those nitrates were detected, and then give you a positive test for gunshot residue. It was decided at the scene not to put the little girl through pouring wax on her, and they also didn't do it to Sharon. They accepted the story that day, largely because of Sharon. Her grief seemed very genuine to them. But the lead investigator, while acknowledging that Sharon's grief seemed sincere, was thinking about this little girl, mostly about her size. What were the odds she pulled a trigger? And that one shot hit James in the head. Would she even be able to use enough force to pull the trigger? To test this, two days after the shooting, the police put an unloaded twenty-two in front of Elizabeth. Sharon was against this. She did not want to put her daughter through it, but they did it as gently as they could, just prompting her to go ahead and pick up the gun and play with it. I understand why they did this, but just this idea of giving a two-year-old a real gun to play with makes me tense up. Anyway, Elizabeth picked up the gun and managed to click the safety on and off a few times, but she didn't pull the trigger. She didn't even really try. But clicking the safety seemed like a step towards her actually being the accidental shooter. Friends and neighbors told the police that James did not normally secure his gun, so the idea that it was in the reach of a child wasn't surprising. Maybe he thought the safety would be enough, but Elizabeth proved it wasn't. They ran some tests, trying to figure out if the pressure used to pull the trigger was possible with a two-and-a-half-year-old, but they couldn't come to any conclusive decision on that. So I did what I do, and I did a Google search on toddler shoots gun to see the ages of children accidentally shooting people and themselves. And all I'm going to say at this point is secure your frickin' guns. Children under the age of four shoot people or themselves on an average of once a week in the United States. 
And those are shots that lead to injury or loss of life. Who knows how many get their parents' unsecured guns and shoot into the floor or into the wall? I guarantee parents aren't calling the police to tell on themselves in those situations where no one got hurt. Basically, you are way more likely to be shot by a toddler with a gun than you are encountering a shoe bomber on a plane, but we all take our shoes off. Please, please, please use this moment to just make sure your guns are inaccessible to any children who come into your house. If the gun is in your house for security and you feel you need access to it, you can get a quick open gun safe for your nightstand for $150 or less at Lowe's. These can be open in one or two seconds, and some are even biometric, making it even less likely your child will be able to get into it. If that gun is there to protect your family, $150 to protect them even further should not be an issue. So let's get back to the story where Elizabeth may or may not have shot her father, like apparently 50 plus other toddlers in America every year. This was a question mark for some of the investigators, though some accepted it as what happened. Sharon looked the part of a grief-stricken widow. Her reaction appeared genuine, and she even had to be sedated after the shooting. And other people told the police that Elizabeth did love playing with toy guns, like cap guns that make a noise when you pull the trigger— so putting her finger on the trigger to see how the gun worked is plausible. Sharon said she heard Elizabeth say, Daddy, how does this thing work? So maybe she did try to pull the trigger, but it was too hard for her. But then she climbed up on the bed to get help from James, who was lying down, and her body weight may have leaned in and she accidentally pulled the trigger. We know she demonstrated that she could easily disengage the safety. Now, that is not what I think happened, but it is a reasonable conclusion to come to. For me, I can't overlook the entirety of the circumstances. James and Sharon were arguing a lot, and Sharon wanted a divorce that her husband wasn't inclined to pursue and or make easy on her. But even if he didn't stand in her way, James was not about to give her the $1,000 she felt she needed or wanted to get a new start. And then there was the life insurance money. For a 25-year-old man, James Kinney had a lot of life insurance. I double-checked my sources on this because the amount seemed to be exaggerated, but most sources put the total amount as around $250,000, and that is in 1960. The average income for Americans at the time was about $5,600 a year. James's death got Sharon out of the marriage and set her up financially. And because the police ruled this an accidental shooting, Sharon collected that insurance money. On April 18th, 1960, a month after her husband died, Sharon went to a car dealership to buy her dream car with some of that money, a blue Ford Thunderbird. The car salesman was 23-year-old Walt Jones, and in a progression of circumstances that aren't entirely clear, Sharon almost immediately started a relationship with Walt in spite of him being married to his high school sweetheart, Patricia. Walt had joined the military right after high school, and the couple had two kids. When he was discharged, they moved back to Missouri, where he found work selling cars and where Patricia worked for the IRS as a file clerk. She thought they were happily married until about a month into her husband's affair with Sharon, that's when she started getting suspicious about her husband working late hours more often. It's not like people were buying cars at nine at night. Then on Friday, May 27th, a little over a month after meeting Sharon Kinney, Walt Jones went to the police to report his wife Patricia missing. He told the police that the two had a fight two nights before when he came home from work very late, it was around 11 p.m. 
It wasn't that he was late this one time, it's that he had been late a few times in the last month without much of an explanation, and like I said, Patricia suspected something was up. Walt said they went to bed after arguing, and Patricia was still angry when she left for work on Thursday morning. When she didn't come home on Thursday evening, Walt called his parents to come help with the kids, and then he called the people who Patricia had carpooled to work with. They told him that after work on Thursday, Patricia asked them to wait a minute because she had to talk with someone. Patricia then approached a light-colored Chevy driven by a woman. After talking to this woman for a minute, Patricia went back to her coworkers and told them to go on home without her. She then got into the Chevy with that other woman and they drove off. At first, this sounded to Walt like Patricia was staying with a friend for the night, maybe to teach him a lesson about what it felt like to be in her shoes, work all day, come home to their young children, and then have to deal with not knowing where your partner is. But when Walt heard the description of the woman in the Chevy, he thought it sounded a lot like Sharon Kinney. And the car was the same color and make of Sharon's father's car. So Walt called Sharon, and she admitted it was her who talked to Patricia after work that day. She wanted Patricia to know about the affair, Sort of. She called Patricia at work and told her that it was her imaginary sister who was having the affair with Walt. She wanted Patricia to know, but didn't want to admit it was her. Since Patricia already suspected Walt was cheating, she agreed to meet with Sharon to find out more about the affair with this sister. They talked as Sharon drove Patricia home, and then she dropped her off about a block from the house. As she pulled away, Sharon said she saw Patricia talking to a man in a green car. Surely Patricia was just angry and hurt and was just off somewhere cooling down. And that's what Walt thought. But then Patricia didn't show up to work on Friday. So Walt went to Sharon's place and confronted her. According to him, he even threatened her with a knife, believing Sharon knew what happened to Patricia. Possibly she had even done something to get back at him, because that Wednesday night where Walt came home really late and had that argument with Patricia, well, there was a reason he was so late, and that was that he had been fighting with Sharon before and had broke things off with her. Sharon had told him she was pregnant and demanded he leave Patricia for her. Walt refused, and he told Sharon he didn't even believe her that she was pregnant. They argued, and Walt walked out, breaking things off with her. So Sharon telling Patricia about the affair was definitely to get back at Walt, but did she do something worse? Now, Sharon told Walt that Patricia was alive and well when she dropped her off. It was around 6 p.m. on Thursday, and she had no idea where Patricia was. Walt wasn't so sure, so he went to the police and reported Patricia missing on Friday evening. Several hours later, shortly after midnight, a man named John Baldiz called the police from a gas station. He had been out in Independence near an abandoned farm when he found the body of a woman. The spot was a well-known lover's lane. The police met John at the scene, and he explained that he had pulled over to pee when he saw the body. A purse was found nearby and had the identification of 23-year-old Patricia Jones. Patricia had been shot in the head, shoulders, and abdomen. The shot to the abdomen left burn marks on her skirt, showing that it was at a very close range. Though her underwear had been taken off and her skirt was hiked up, there were no physical signs of a sexual assault. A bullet found under the body, apparently the one that had gone through her abdomen, showed the murder weapon was a 22. And because the shot went through soft flesh and sunk into soft dirt, 
it was in remarkably good shape. If they could find the gun, the investigators felt good about their chances of matching the bullet. But they couldn't find the gun. They searched the area and dragged nearby bodies of water, but they just couldn't find it. John Baldiz, the man who found the body, was questioned a little more closely about why he pulled over in that spot to begin with. He claimed he had been out in that rural area alone, but the body wasn't at the edge of the field. You had to walk through some tall grass to get to it. So why, if he was alone in the dark, did John walk that far into the field to urinate? There was no reason for it. And as someone who has lived in this area for a while, I can tell you that you don't walk into tall grass from May until winter unless you like to get bitten by things. So the story didn't add up. On being pushed a little, John admitted he went to the farm to park with his girlfriend. They saw something in the grass because of the headlights. He walked out a bit, and that's when he found the body, but his girlfriend insisted he bring her home before calling the police and getting her involved in this entire thing. Though that story sounded plausible enough, it still didn't sit right with the investigators. Maybe it was how John was telling the story. They just didn't feel he was telling everything he knew, so they kept pushing. And John finally admitted he was actually out at that particular spot because he was actively looking for Patricia. He said his girlfriend knew her and said that she was probably out parking with another man to get back at her husband. She suggested they go looking for Patricia. To John, an excuse to go to various lovers' lanes with his girlfriend sounded like a good idea. So they drove around, and that is when they found the body. And that's when John's girlfriend, who was Sharon Kinney, if you hadn't guessed already, told him she needed to be dropped off at home before he went to the police. She was the last one who had seen Patricia alive, and if she was also the person who found her body, things would look very suspicious. She didn't want to be implicated in something she claimed she had nothing to do with. The murder weapon was a twenty-two, which was the same caliber that killed her husband, James Kinney, but it couldn't have been the same gun because the sheriff had not released the gun back to Sharon yet. But there was enough here to bring Sharon in for an interrogation. Like Sharon knew would happen, being the last one to see Patricia alive and being there when the body was found put a huge cloud of suspicion over her. But she didn't sit under that cloud alone. We have a philandering husband whose girlfriend may have been pregnant. And we have John Baldiz, who, from where the police sat, seemed to have Sharon leading him around by the nose, or maybe another body part. It could have been a conspiracy between any combination of these three people. All three were questioned and interrogated repeatedly. Walt and John both voluntarily took polygraphs and passed them, while Sharon refused to take one. Sharon also insisted it was John's decision to go to that particular location to look for Patricia's body. She didn't tell him to go there like she had some insider knowledge of where Patricia's body was. And John backed this up. He was the one who decided to drive out there. So if anyone went there with the purpose of finding the body, it was John. However, I don't think it can be ignored that Sharon had planted the idea that Patricia was parking with another man and John just so happened to go to a lover's lane. It was one that he and Sharon had been to before. And this is exactly how manipulation works. You plant enough information to guide someone to the answer you want them to come up with, and then they think it's their idea. We also have the issue of the murder weapon. A search of Sharon's home found a box for a 22 that was empty. 
Sharon said this was a gun she bought to replace the one the sheriff had taken after her husband's death. She admitted to having bought it about two weeks before Patricia's murder, but she just so happened to lose it, according to her, about a week after she bought it. Circumstantially, this case seemed to be pointing in one direction, toward Sharon Kinney. But could they prove it? Forensics, for what they were in 1960, would not be a help here. Due to a mix-up, the funeral home picked up Patricia's body before the autopsy was done. When the issue was realized and she was returned to the medical examiner, the body had already been washed and embalmed. This caused a massive issue regarding time of death. Sharon said she dropped Patricia off at 6 p.m. on Thursday. Had they been able to test her stomach contents, they would have some idea if this was true or not. If they showed signs of her lunch from Thursday, it meant she likely was killed around the time she was with Sharon. But if her stomach was empty or had food she wasn't known to have eaten on Thursday, Patricia may have been somewhere alive on Thursday night and killed closer to the time her body was found. Though there were these issues with the case, the state decided to go ahead with what they had. Sharon Kinney was arrested on May 31st, 1960, and charged with the murder of Patricia Jones. She was then charged with the murder of her husband, James Kinney. The trial for Patricia's murder would go first, but it had to wait because, surprise, Sharon wasn't lying when she told Walt she was pregnant. However, now she was saying it was the child of her husband, James Kinney. She must have gotten pregnant right before his death. Sharon then gave birth in mid-January 1961. In doing some reverse math, Sharon either went a full five weeks past her due date or the baby wasn't her husband's. The trial was finally held in June 1961, just over a year after Patricia's murder. And as expected, the time of death was central to this case for both sides. The prosecution said the time of death was Thursday, May 26th, between 6 and 7 p.m., the same time Sharon said she left Patricia Jones a block from her home. The defense said it was more like 8 to 9 p.m. on Friday, May 27th. Both sides presented evidence backing up their timelines, and the defense said that even if the prosecution theory is right and Patricia was killed on Thursday, it didn't really matter because Sharon had an alibi. Now, Sharon's alibi doesn't really pick up until around 7 p.m., giving Sharon some time to have committed the crime. However, not very much. It would have been extremely tight for her to have either driven Patricia to the field to kill her there or having killed her somewhere else and then dumped her. Either way, Sharon would have really been rushing around to have accomplished all of this. Now, the murder weapon became another issue. The prosecution tried to tie Sharon at least to the same type of gun based on that box, even though they never found the gun. They called to the stand the man who sold Sharon that 22 that she supposedly lost. He testified that he had used the gun to shoot into a tree stump. This was news to both sides, and the judge allowed the defense and the prosecution to go out to the stump to try to find the bullet. It was a stump that had several shots in it, so it was going to be a bit of a process. In the end, only one twenty-two bullet was found when they cut into that wooden stump. However, they had damaged that bullet in the process of cutting the stump down, and it was useless to try to match it to anything. It ended up being a complete waste of time. In the end, the jury found just too many holes in the prosecution's story. 
each circumstantial piece of evidence had an alternative explanation, which Sharon's high-priced defense team was quick to point out. Sharon was found not guilty. The courtroom actually erupted in cheers at the verdict, and a juror was seen asking Sharon for her autograph afterwards. But Sharon still had one more trial to go through for the murder of her husband, James Kinney. The state had tried the Patricia Jones murder case first because they believed it was the stronger case, and well, we saw how that went. So they were trying to get more evidence against Sharon in James's case before trial. John Baldiz had turned on Sharon by this point. He was married to someone else and willing to tell the police more about the whole situation. And one of the key things he said was that Sharon once told him that if he would kill James for her, she would give him a thousand dollars. When he said no way, Sharon asked if he knew anyone who would. He said yes, and she said if he could find that person to let her know. That happened two to three weeks before James was killed, but John never actually tried to find anyone. So the police decided to try to get Sharon on a recording admitting to this offer of $1,000. But 1961 Missouri police didn't necessarily have the most high-tech equipment, so John drove around with Sharon while an officer was literally in the trunk of the car trying to record them. John brought up the $1,000, and Sharon immediately changed the subject. Pretty much any time John wanted to talk about James Kinney's death or the upcoming trial, Sharon would just find something else to talk about. So while they didn't have Sharon admitting to it on tape, as they had hoped would happen, they did have John willing to testify about it, so at least it was something. The trial was held in January 1962, nearly two years after James Kinney's death. And to the shock of many, James's parents stood by Sharon, publicly at least. What the public didn't know was that this was a negotiated support. The Kinneys loved their grandchildren very much. The kids were what they had left of James, and access to them was dependent on Sharon's mood. Her defense attorney, Alex Peebles, essentially promised them that Sharon's mood would favor generous visits if they showed the world that they supported her. The victim's parents on the side of the accused murderer was good PR. Sharon got PR, and the Kinneys got to see their grandchildren— It was win-win, even if the Kinneys had to bite their tongues a bit. Alex Peebles was a well-known defense attorney here in Kansas City, and his name pops up if you follow pretty much any case from the 1960s, 1970s particularly. He actually came up in a Patreon episode I did on a fugitive from this area named Michael Klein. Peebles was good at his job, and he knew public perception mattered. When the trial occurred, John Baldiz took the stand to talk about how Sharon tried to solicit the murder of James Kinney. But now he changed his story a little bit. He testified that, yes, Sharon offered him the $1,000, but now he's saying it was clearly a joke. Asked what he meant about this, John told a story about how one night he was talking with Sharon and told her that he would carry her away if it wasn't for her husband. And Sharon said, I'll just give you a grand and we'll get rid of him. Then they both laughed. That was all that was said on the matter. It was clearly a joke. This contradicted what John had told the sheriff in his sworn statement, and it also contradicted what he told the grand jury. He was asked point blank during the grand jury proceedings if he thought Sharon was serious about the $1,000, and he said yes. This was an unexpected blow to the case, so the prosecution began asking John leading questions to the defense objections, of course. They were trying to impeach their own witness. It's important to know that in U.S. courts, there are different rules around direct examination 
and cross-examination. Because John was a state's witness, this was direct examination. And they can't ask the same leading questions that they could have if it was a cross-examination. You aren't allowed to cross-examine your own witness just because they didn't give you the answer you wanted. If the judge determines a witness is a hostile witness, some leeway is given. Actually, quite a bit of leeway is given, but that didn't happen here. The prosecution just forged ahead with cross-examining their own witness while the defense kept objecting. Now, this is one of those somewhat boring trial issues that actually becomes pretty important later. Even with John's changing testimony, the state managed to prove their case. After five and a half hours of deliberation, Sharon Kinney, the 22-year-old mother of three small children, was found guilty, and she was sentenced to life in prison. And then Sharon appealed on procedural grounds. One issue was the state's questioning of John. It was improper. And the other issue raised was the size of the jury pool. They didn't call as many prospective jurors as they should have, so that also limited the number of strikes the defense had against jurors who may have been prejudiced against Sharon. Appeals come up all the time here on Crime Lines, and a lot of the time I just say they appealed and it was denied. I don't get into the grounds of the appeal unless it's relevant, and that's because 95% of the time, especially with direct appeals, they're very mundane procedural issues like this. Because this isn't law school, we get to glance over those. But in this case, I'm bringing them up because it worked. Sharon's conviction was overturned 18 months into her life sentence, and she was released on bail pending retrial. And this is where the case goes off the rails, in the event we were on the rails to start with. I don't know that we ever were. The new trial was to be held March 1964, but after they seated a jury, it was discovered one of the jurors had a conflict. They had used the services of the law partner of the prosecutor. That would have been enough to have booted him from the jury, And because the jury was already seated, the trial officially had begun, and therefore, it had to be declared a mistrial, and they started all over again. Three months later, in June 1964, the third trial for James Kinney's murder was held, and it ended in a hung jury. They were deadlocked 7-5 to in favor of an acquittal. Trial number four was set for October 1964. We're talking three trials in 10 months. But this trial wouldn't even happen because in September of 1964, Sharon Kinney was arrested for another murder, this time in Mexico. After leaving the kids with her in-laws, Sharon and her new boyfriend, Frank Palessi, drove to Mexico. Sharon traveled under the name Jeanette Palessi and claimed to be Frank's wife. They took two days to get down to the border, but the car that they were using wasn't actually there, so they were not allowed to drive it into Mexico. They parked the car and then used a taxi service to cross the border. Once in Mexico, they got bus tickets to get to Mexico City. Now, the reason they were in Mexico is disputed. Some think Sharon was worried about the next trial, and she had decided to go on the run but she said that she and Frank were there to get married. But instead of getting married, the two ended up getting sick with an intestinal infection, and they were holed up in their hotel room for a while. Sharon left the room allegedly to go get some medicine, but she claims she found the pharmacy closed. So instead, she went to a bar. According to Sharon, she brought a gun with her for her protection because Frank was too sick to go out with her. In the bar, Sharon met a man named Francisco Ordanez who lived in Chicago, and he was in his native Mexico visiting. Being that he spoke English, the two struck up a conversation, and he bought Sharon a drink before inviting her back to his hotel room. Around 3 a.m., a clerk in the hotel heard gunshots coming from Francisco's room. 
When he ran in there, he found Francisco on the bed, and Sharon was either in or near the bathroom. One report said it looked like she was counting money. When Sharon saw the hotel clerk, she shot at him, hitting him in the arm. He fled the room, but then shut the door and locked it from the outside so Sharon couldn't leave. He then called the police. Sharon Kinney was arrested and charged with murder again. When she called her Kansas City attorney, Alex Peebles, and told him that she was locked up in Mexico on a murder charge, he reportedly replied, tell me something new. Sharon claimed the shooting was in self-defense after Francisco had tried to rape her. She only shot at the clerk because when he barged into the room, he had scared her. But the police believed Sharon had gone back to the hotel with Francisco in order to rob him when he refused to turn over the money and possibly even tried to overpower her and get the gun away from her. She shot him, and they believe she shot the clerk in an attempt to get away with it. When the police searched Sharon's hotel room, they found what looked like a kit for a life on the run. She had money, she had a fake ID, she had guns and ammo. One of the guns was a twenty-two. At the request of the police in Missouri, the Mexican police fired three bullets from the gun and mailed the bullets to Missouri. When ballistics got them, they matched them to the bullet recovered from the Patricia Jones murder scene. Because the U.S. has near-absolute double jeopardy laws, Sharon Kidney could not be retried even though they found her with the murder weapon. But Francisco's case was a different story. Mexico decided to try her for that murder rather than send her back to the U.S. to stand trial for James Kinney's case first. This meant that Missouri issued a warrant for Sharon's arrest after she missed her October trial date. Sharon was tried and convicted in Mexico. She was sentenced to 10 years, and of course she appealed it. But this appeal backfired. The court found that the sentence was actually too lenient, and they tacked on an additional three years for a total of a 13-year sentence. And when Sharon finished her sentence in Mexico, she would be deported back to the United States and immediately arrested on that warrant out of Missouri. In the meantime, Sharon was spending her days in a Mexican prison, getting used to the routine and learning the language. About five years into her 13-year sentence, on December 7, 1969, Sharon was watching a movie during a family visit day at the prison. Sharon had no one to visit her, so she just sat to watch the movie. While the other inmates got to see their own children, Sharon's were growing up in the United States without her. During the movie, power was lost for a short time. Afterwards, the police did their routine roll call head check at 5 p.m. Sharon was not there. But it wasn't until she missed a second roll call, closer to lights out, did anyone become alarmed. It wasn't until 2 a.m. that the police were alerted to her escape. There was an extensive but rather short-lived manhunt for her. Sharon had a pretty big head start, and they weren't sure if she headed north to the United States or south to Guatemala. With her mastery of Spanish, thanks to the five years she spent in prison there, she could have easily gotten around anywhere in Mexico or Central America. It was assumed Sharon used the temporary blackout during the movie to sneak past the guards, but it also seemed like quite the coincidence that Sharon was ready to run during that brief and unpredictable scenario. And then there was the door she likely went through that just so happened to be unlocked at the same time. And no one alerted authorities until hours after Sharon missed her second roll call. Suspicion fell on the guards, and they were investigated to see if they had possibly taken a bribe from Sharon to aid her in her escape. 
But in the spirit of one of my favorite sayings, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by incompetence, this could have been the prison's lackadaisical approach to security, all which were uncovered during the investigation. They did not have enough guards for the number of prisoners they had, and they had pretty much no procedures in place to double-check issues like unsecured doors. Sharon Kinney very well may have just gotten very, very lucky that day. And if you remember earlier in the episode when I said that Sharon's high-priced attorney was also the attorney for a fugitive from this area, well, now he was the attorney for two fugitives. Just as Michael Klein has never been found, neither has Sharon Kinney. Alex Peebles lived into his 90s, and when he would be interviewed about his life in Missouri, knowing famous people like Harry Truman, all anyone wanted to talk about was Michael Klein and Sharon Kinney. Sharon was 30 years old when she disappeared and would be 81 years old right now if she's still alive, which she might be, living in an expat community in Mexico under an assumed name, possibly surrounded by grandchildren who don't know her story. If Sharon Kinney has died, she died under that fake name or maybe as a Jane Doe. Sharon falls into the rare category of a female serial killer, and she fits the mold. She remorselessly kills for what she wants, whether it was money, freedom, or to hold on to a boyfriend. And she served around seven or eight years in prison total for three murders and then spent a lifetime on the run. As it stands right now, Sharon has only been convicted of one murder, that of Francisco Ordonez. Normally, that means I would have said allegedly in relation to the two other murders, but I'm going to let go of some ethical considerations here and just be blunt. Sharon Kinney killed James Kinney, Patricia Jones, and Francisco Ordonez in cold blood. She is a serial killer, and if she would like to sue me for defamation for saying that, I live here in Jackson County, Missouri, Sharon, for jurisdictional reasons, It's best you go ahead and just file right in downtown KC. I am sure the courthouse would love to hear from you. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for.